to be around in the vicinity if somebody wanted to go to a retreat center in the Netherlands for example and they want their coach around perhaps the next day they can have a coaching session on site so if anything were to happen they know that somebody that they trust can be there within five minutes I think that that's a service I offer but I, I haven't done that yet actually because it just people didn't didn't ask for it it's also quite expensive to fly a new coach uh, into a different country um, just yeah. to kind of have them around Let's say psychedelics were completely legal. Would you feel any differently? Would you want to sit with clients? It sounds like you don't. That you really see the space with coaching and, and being in a vulnerable state as different. What would your utopian coaching practice look like? Well, if it were legal, we would start doing a lot of research and look at, you know, very systematically at um, what do we need, what, what's happening when somebody gets gets coached on psychedelics. But like, I mean, even with legal substances, we need to pass stringent ethic uh, committees. So you can't just like give somebody something. I mean, even if you, you want to research people who had a drink, you know, you, you need to be very careful and it's uh, very complicated to get approval for these kind of studies. In my ideal world, we would have already done 20, 30 years of research and we would have developed methodologies on what would be a good way to move through that. What I can imagine is that you would have a good relationship with a sitter. You would have a, the coach and the person who would sit with a client would talk to each other with the permission of the client, obviously, so that the sitter may take notes or you know write certain things down that seem to be significant uh, words that the client might have said or repeated, interesting situations or any significant moments could then be communicated to the coach and we could start the coaching conversation based on, on some of these insights that sometimes the clients forget. I could see how a coach could also be a Sitter, but I think they would need it to be very boundaried and make it very clear why they're there for and what their role is. Pretty much all sitters I've talked to uh, said very clearly, don't interfere with the experience. I mean, you're there to hold space. You know, maybe reassure them that they're they're doing fine and it's it's okay and you know they're doing great and they're not at any risk of harm. But it's a very different thing to coaching. And personally, I would probably be tempted to coach, and I don't want to coach. I would want to do that after. Part of me would want to sit through it and kind of see it and experience it. It it might add something to the coaching if you can hold that boundary very clearly. And I just don't have any experience with sitting while being the coach, so that's not something I would do. I'm sure others will and are successfully doing so. so almost a multidisciplinary approach you have the sitter you have the coach the client and that's a really interesting way to look at it are you ever interested in trying to be a coach and a sitter just to see what the experience is like if it was allowed Well, I would be lying if I wouldn't say I'm not interested. It's not on the cards professionally. So maybe at some point in the future, I'll, I'll do a training in sitting and I'll, I'll find a way to gain the necessary experience of sitting with somebody professionally. And I might combine the skills that I have in coaching and the skills that I have in sitting and combine them. For me personally, I mean, maybe it's also part of my character is I want to do things properly. I don't want to take a risk when it comes to working with powerful substances, just as such. I, I would want to gain sufficient experience in sitting before I would attempt to combine the two or offer them at the same time. So I live in Oakland, California, which is the second city in the United States to decriminalize psychedelic plants. So that includes sales and all sorts of things. However, it's still illegal on a state and federal level. So I just feel like I know a lot of sitters. I know a lot of people that are kind of combining lots of different ways of doing it. And so I feel like it's almost normalized to me that you would maybe mash the two together. And so it is great hearing your perspective because I think you're right. We have to be super safe. They're very powerful substances. Where I hear the opinions go very far apart is uh, when where's that line between coaching and therapy? And in a way, I've been discussing that uh, since I started coaching. As I said, I'm, I was always interested in going that little bit deeper. So we're still discussing among existential coaches where that line is between coaching and therapy. There's some good frameworks. There's some good starting points. You know, the coaching is more about surface level change, where therapy is more deep seated change. It's a good starting point, not necessarily true, but there's certainly a trend in that. Similarly with coaches working with people who are resourceful and whole versus therapists who tend to work with people who are broken or unable to cope. It's certainly not always true, but it's a good starting point. Also, the notion that coaches often work with the present and the future and therapists work more with the past and the present. Certainly not always true, 
but all three together can give you a, a more of an idea of what the difference between coaching and therapy is. But ultimately, every practitioner needs to, what I always call, frame their space. Sometimes you frame your space firmly in the performance coaching in organizations area, and maybe you work with stress reduction and communication styles, or you work with using mindfulness Some practitioners frame their space very much in the therapeutic. I work with bereavement and I work with autism or I work with post-traumatic stress. You need to frame that space and offer your services within that. Here's what I can and here's what I can't do. Here's what I want to do and here's what I don't want to do. You know, So I always say you need to be willing and able to provide the service that you're offering to that client. Just because a client comes with a, an ail, like a pain or something they want to work on doesn't mean that you have to To provide that service. If somebody comes and they say, well, I'm very depressed, I want to, uh, you know, move and find a new house, then you can use some coaching techniques potentially to help that person move house. If it's not about the uh, resolving the root of their depression, which is much better suited in, in a therapy room, then perhaps a coach can provide tremendous value. If somebody's just lost somebody, I can have potentially have a very uh, effective existential conversation about the meaning of endings and how they relate to that to then move forward with their life. But chances are that if somebody's gone through a bereavement, they might not be able to engage in that kind of conversation To move forward. Chances are they just have to process that and make sense of it. I may or may not have the skills to have that conversation with them. But every coach, every therapist, every practitioner needs to have that conversation with themselves and be able to communicate what their framework is and at what point there might be a line. And when that line comes, when you're using psychedelics or when uh, in the psychedelic space, I think that line gets crossed much more easily than in coaching as usual, if you wanted to call it like that. It's much more likely that somebody comes back from such an experience and some doors opened into a space where maybe as a coach, you have nothing to do there. You know, maybe that's something they need to work with somebody else. So I think it's so important that coaches who work in the psychedelic space have a solid referral network and uh, a whole range of therapists available at their fingertips uh, that they can refer clients to if, if that should be necessary. You generally work with people who are resourceful and whole, as I said, who are generally okay. And sometimes for people who are generally okay, they open a door and there's a, a world of pain behind it. And they didn't know, you know, and uh, at that point, maybe it's better to refer them. Maybe they just have a really pleasant experience and they have their next amazing business idea, you know, that also has happened. And you just never quite know where the psychedelic experience will lead you, where you will end up, what you will end up knowing or experiencing. So I think as a coach, when somebody, when you open that space and somebody has an experience and they come back and they've opened all these doors and they talk about it now, just need to be uh, very aware of what they're bringing and at what point you will need to, at, at what point, not you will need to, at what point is the client better off working with somebody else? You know, I think that's the ultimate line. Do you think there's a space for maybe, again, a multidisciplinary approach with a sitter, a coach and a therapist that all can communicate and come up, you know, help the client together? Absolutely. I'm a, I'm a fan of working in collaboration with people. I've, I've started that with uh, other coaches so that there's like a ping pong approach, so to speak, where a client has two coaches, one who works on the existential foundations and the other one works with performance and behavior and accountability. You know, one kind of uh, what, what's what drives me and the other one, how can I get shit done? I can imagine a similar, um, and I, I've worked in the past, um, not in a psychedelic space, um, but I've, I've worked with some therapists in parallel. And I love it when a, co when a client, a coaching client comes to me and it says, I'm, I'm also working with a therapist. Is that an issue? And I'm like, no, this is great. You know, because we have a safety net for th when things open up that, you know, we feel this is not really a coaching issue right now. or This is not really a coaching thing. Uh, they can take that to the therapist. This is amazing. So yes, I would, I would love to see more coaching coaches and therapists partnering up. Have you ever had a conversation with someone's therapist while you were working with a client? Yeah, I was amazed at how eager uh, some of the clients were. That was like, oh yeah, you can talk to my therapist. And they tend to appreciate that. We just need to work in a three-way container so that uh, that we're all aware of, of what we're doing there. Setting something up as a three-way relationship, that would be amazing. I haven't done that yet. So from the very beginning that you would say, okay, coach, therapist, and client meet up on a three-way Zoom. Then you you discuss the framework of what we're doing here. And at what point would you, would you go see one or the other? And, you know, would coach and uh, therapist then check in regularly or, you know, would you, how, how would that look like? I mean, the, the possibilities are endless.
Yeah, as a nurse, I mean, a lot of what I do is is work with a multidisciplinary team with the neurologist, neurosurgeon, everyone and coming up to help the patient in the best way. And so it would make sense in this space to be able to have a team approach for the client. And yeah, it sounds like a really amazing opportunity. And it sounds like it's worked for you or worked for the client, worked for your client. It, it's, it feels safer when you know that your client uh, has a therapist that is just on the other end of a phone line or that they're already scheduled to meet regularly. It does make you feel safer as a coach.